thank you for joining us in this webinar that aims to inform about the state of health of the Mesoamerican Reef. This webinar is presented by the Earth Journalism Network and the Healthy Reefs Initiative. My name is Lucy Calderon. I'm a Guatemalan journalist the, and the editor of the Mesoamerican Reef Reporting Project that the EJN launched last year in order to, to help journalists of the region to improve the quantity and quality of the reports on the Mesoamerican Reef. We are going to start by listening to Melanie McField. She is the founder and director of the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People Initiative. Then we are going to listen to James Fan, the executive director of the EJN. And last, I'm going to share with you a little about the Mesoamerican Reef Reporting Project. Uh, before I open the microphone for Melanie, please let me tell you something about her. Melanie is the founder and director of the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People Initiative, a multi-institutional effort to track the health of the Mesoamerica Reef ecosystem and evaluate progress implementing management strategies aimed at ensuring its long-term integrity. The program has been underway in Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico for 14 years, producing five Mesoamerican Reef report cards and three eco-audits. The HRI now includes includes 73 partner organizations working in the Mesoamerican Reef. Melanie holds a PhD in marine science from the University of South Florida based on evaluation of the influence of disturbance and management on reef community structure in Belize. Belize. She has 34 peer-reviewed research papers focused on coral reef community ecology, coral bleaching, chemical contamination, and management effectiveness one book and seven book chapters, 20 technical publications and numerous newspaper and magazine articles. Please welcome to Melanie, who is going to tell us about the Reef Report Card. Welcome, Melanie. I'm muted. Hold on. Do you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Um, I will just get started and let you know that we did launch this in the four countries in the region, in Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, on the 13th. And we are very happy to have a little more international exposure and get in touch with a number of you through this webinar. So just to make sure everyone knows we're on the same page when we talk of the Mesoamerican Reef, this is the geography we're looking at. It includes the Quintana Roo, Mexico, all of Belize, the Caribbean coast of Guatemala and that north coast of Honduras and their associated reef habitats. The Healthy Reefs Initiative began in 2004, mainly with this idea of coming up with a common vision um, for what do we mean by reef health? You know, you can say uh, all these organizations are working to improve the health of the reef, but we really had to come up with a framework of indicators, these threshold values, so we could actually grade them like you grade your students in school. So, We've done that, we've now produced, this is our sixth report card on the health of the reef. And we also do eco audits in alternating years and we'll, we'll be issuing our fourth eco audit soon um, on the management and implementation of these recommended, recommended management actions, what we can do to uh, make things better. And we've just served as a great platform for collaboration across all these countries and with the different uh, NGOs and government departments that are working together. We have 73 partner organizations. That just kind of shows you what's available. All of this is online. Um, the book that is kind of scientific foundations took a couple years to produce all those indicators. So we have a lot more indicators that some of our partners use in helping to understand their particular work and tracking their work. But today we're focusing strictly on the reef health and on our main, these four main indicators of reef health. We do a lot of capacity building in the region. Um, 250 biologists have been trained over the last decade or 11 or 12 years, um, including 16 that are like now certified to train other people. And we've got over 250 database users. And this database is online and available and you'll see the web address of that. When I'm talking of the we, you probably think of that little Healthy Reefs logo, but this is the real we. This is the group it takes to get all of this work done. So those are the 73 partners. You can see them on the back of this report card and on our website. 
Here's just a quick look. When you go into our website and then click on the data explorer, you can then look at um, what's going on in the REACH system by site or by subregion. This one is by subregion. And you can take that little um, yellow, have, yeah, you can take this little bar and scroll it over and that can change the time, time frame that you're looking at. You can look at the coral cover, which is the amount of living co coral that's on the bottom. Look at fleshy macroalgae, which we don't want to have much of that. We want to have more of the coral. Uh, then we've got herbivorous fish biomass and commercial fish biomass. So all of these things, and you can also look at coral disease. This isn't live, so I can't click on anything. But you can look at disease and bleaching also on this same website. So just to give you a look at the threshold values that I mentioned, these are these four indicators that we include in the Reef Health Report Card. So it's kind of like thinking about um, your stock market has, I don't know how many uh, publicly traded stocks on it. If you just take, say, the Dow Jones, you've got one number that has synthesized a selection of different um, indicators. So different stocks that would like represent the market. These are similar to that because they, we take two from the benthic component. So that's the reef structure, coral and algae, and then two from the fish component, those herbivores that are so important, and then the key commercial species to make sure that we do need to have some of those top predators there, groupers and snappers. So each of these were ranked through a process of coming up with um, what we consider to be very good, good, fair, poor, critical. And that's the basis of this reef health index. Because we've done that for this reef system, we can now come up with a grade. So all these little dots you see on the map here are the reef sites that we monitored. It was 286 sites this time. And um, they get a color. And so the red is critical, orange is poor, yellow is fair, green is good, blue is very good. Fortunately, hard to find those blue ones. There is one up here in Cozumel. There's two here in Glovers and one down there in Southern Belize. So those are the very good reefs. So that meant that all four of those indicators had to be scored, you know, in a very good category because you just take it to across the board average of those. But these pie charts here, these donut type charts show you for overall for the whole Mesoamerican reef, you can see what percent of sites are in different condition. So 16% of the sites are critical. Um, the major class was poor. And then you can compare that to the other sites. I don't know if you can see that because in my view, my face is in the way. There we go, that's better. I got rid of the, get rid of the people. We don't need to see them. Let's look at the data. That's nice. So there you can see Belize, you know, we had 104 sites. So that's the number in the middle that tells you how many sites were collected in each country. And then the percent of sites that fall into each category. So that's one way of looking at it, things. Um, we had 82 surveyors this year that helped collect data in this effort. Um, from 26 organizations. So not all of those 73 partners organizations we have actually get in the water and collect data. So just to keep that in mind, many of them are outreach educational institutions or they do other things that are related to reef management, but not the actual surveyors. Uh -oh. Okay, so here is the reef health index. So that is our kind of Dow Jones average for this uh, 2020 report card which just to not get confused, sometimes we do refer to this, this was data collected in 2018. So in a minute, I'll, you'll see a graphic that talks about um, the change in this index over time. And this number came from data that was collected in 2018, which becomes our 2020 report card. Um, I did the launch in Belize. So this is just showing the, the numbers for Belize compared to the MAR. Belize had the highest reef health index this year. So it's the one that we're kind of holding to the standard. You can see how it's, it's pretty close to what the MAR average was for each of these things. So the coral and macroalgae components are about equal. The, the coral was a little less. And then you've got herbivorous fish biomass down on the lower left and the commercial fish biomass on the lower right. And those, the colors again represent yellow is fair and um, orange is poor. So, and these you can see, that's the cover of coral over in the upper right and the cover of macroalgae in the upper 
sorry, upper left and upper right is the macroalgae. So you see it consistently, that upper right quadrant, the macroalgae has been poor across all the years. The very first sampling was conducted in 2006, and that was formed the 2008 report card. And then you can see pretty much every other year, sometimes there was a little change in the, in the when we did the monitoring, and then we increased slowly over time. Our overall average was going up until this year. This is the first time we've actually measured um, any decline in reef health. So if we want to look at it by country, we can see that the reef health index, Belize did have the highest score with a 3.0, and the herbivorous fish helped with that. that. That averaged out to be a good in Belize. Okay, and the coral cover and the commercial fish were fair, and the macroalgae was poor. So you can see for each country, there's a lot more red in Guatemala. Both the fish categories are critical in Guatemala. Um, the coral cover, however, at the, the area where they have like a good reef, it is quite high and that helped pull up their average and they have a good average coral cover at their 10 sites. Honduras, uh, commercial fish is critical this time and their abrivish fish do dropped by um, like over 50%. It was, it was a major decline. Um, in herbivorous fish this year, although it's still fair. They have traditionally had the highest herbivorous fish, so that was quite a big drop for that time period. Here you can see the trends over time. Um, let's look at Honduras because that's, that's pretty interesting to see. I mean, there was always, 2009 was a year that we had less sampling. You know, this was the first year we had good funding. We did it kind of as an example. This 2009, there was a little less uh, data collected um, so I'm not so sure about that, but we were having some improvements in um, this green line is the biomass of herbivorous fish. And you can see they protected them in 2010. It was starting to go up and then it just crashed. Um, the macroalgae had been going up slowly and that also took a very slight turn, which we don't fully understand. But the coral has been going up. That's very good. This is a slow decline, but it's consistent. It's like there's not any wavering. It's continuing to go down over time in the commercial fish. Now, if you look at Mexico and Belize, you can see some more variability, but similar trends. The commercial, commercial fish going down, and in Belize, kind of more stable. Um, the herbivorous fish going up slightly, and in Belize, going up more. So Belize, they were protected in 2009, so probably around here, and then they began to go up, and it has just consistently gone up. And then the last two, time periods we've been able to see this decline in macroalgal cover. So that's good and the corals are doing okay. They're kind of plugging along, growing. Nothing at this point in time, summer 2018, had decreased their, their coverage. I zoomed in a little more than that for the Belize story, but we'll go on. We can look at subregions too. So countries are interesting because, you know, there's some regulations and things are countrywide. So that you can look at that scale, but you can also look at um, subregions because it's more of a management unit and it's more ecologically um, connected. So when we do with when we look at that, we can see we only have one subregion this year that came out in the good category. That was Cozumel. Four of the seventeen um, improved in in their rankings, mostly going up to fair from poor. But we had seven of seventeen sites that declined. So overall, we had more declines than improvements. This is um, just a little schematic. I encourage everyone to look at it in more detail. Can't really go into it, but it shows the linkages between the coral reefs, seagrass beds, and the reef edge, where we have these spawning aggregations. That's one of the things we wanted to focus on in this report card, is talking about we need the connected, interconnected ecosystems, including coral, um, the coral reefs, back into the mangroves where we've lost 20% of them on a region-wide basis. Um, also, the spawning aggregation sites have largely declined. Most of them have really taken a dive over the last 20 years. Where we have monitoring data, we can see that all of these have just begun to decline. And so that's one of the reasons for the decline in commercial fish, particularly the, the spawners that some of the snappers do and all of the groupers. What do we do about it? These are our efforts. We've been doing protected areas and for bringing back those commercial fish, but our target was many years ago, 2008 report card said 20% by 2020. 
and we have 3% of territorial seas. So we haven't yet achieved anywhere near to our target. We did achieve the region-wide protection of parrotfish, so that was good, and we've seen them increase. The other thing that we've been discussing for years and it needs serious attention is wastewater treatment. This is like a, a sewage uh, treatment facility. We need to have more of these and more, you know, better um, treatment of the waste. So finally, I'll just talk about a few of the issues to give you a flavor for them. This is that stony coral tissue loss disease. It just was recorded as we were out monitoring for this report card began up in Mexico. Well, it began in Florida, 2014, and you see that it took um, all of these like four to five years for it to get down into the lower keys. But in that, this kind of an equivalent distance, 450 kilometers, it spread through Mexico so quickly in summer 2018. And that was just taking nine months to get basically all the way across the coastline. So this is devastating. It's affecting over 22 species of corals. One species, this kind of iconic pillar coral, like 90% of the pillar corals have died in, in Mexico already. You can see at the bottom there, there's kind of a trajectory over time that goes from November to March and it just basically killed the entire colony. On the top here, you can see the, the white line is the, the recently dead tissue. And then over on the right, you can see where it's like filamentous growth already starts to grow over what was the healthy coral like on the left. It started up in, the, so we look, take, looking to the right, you can see Northern Quintana Roo. So it started, a, you know, in that area near Puerto Morelos in Cancun, and it's just kind of moved its way south. Um, it's now in Belize, but only in the very Northern quadrant of Belize. And you can see how much more prevalent it is. This graph is showing the percent of affected colonies and the, per, the percent is up closer to 20%, whereas on average it's down below five, because that's all diseases. So there are a number of other diseases, but this one is the most virulent. So I wanna kind of wrap up with some good stories. Reef restoration, um, it's not affecting these main species of acroporids that has been the target of most of the restoration effort. And we have had a lot of success that, have been, that has been you know, touted regional, uh, globally as this area has done a lot of good quality work on restoring coral reef habitats. But we know that it's not just the corals we need to restore, we have to look at the whole ecosystem and how it functions. So we've started looking at, um, looking at the restoration of a bivery as a functional process. So for that, two of the, we have the parrotfish, which we did and we've now got completely protected in all of them are except coastal Honduras, that part hasn't been protected. But we also need to look at the diadema. We're tracking that and we can see that now we've got almost half the sites have some diadema, but it's very low. And the sites with more diadema, those over on the right, those two bars actually have less macroalgae than the others. So they are effective. So is the crab. And these crabs have been largely overlooked. They are good herbivores. They don't damage the reef at all. I and mean, the way that they um, graze on the reef. And we did a little experiment putting crabs out and you can see how they really, they reduced the fleshy macroalgae, which is the green, and then they um, increased the crustose coralline algae, which is the orange. That's a good facilitator of coral, cre coral um, recruits. So that's a good thing. We're now working on mariculture. We've got some little trials underway with a really low tech way of growing these things in, in little screened cages, um, either in a tank or out um, by the dock. And so fishermen could learn to do this and then put them out on the reef and let them graze down algae while they grow and they could be caught later. So it's kind of an alternative livelihood that they could employ. This area, the wastewater has, remains a major challenge. We, we're not really getting much um, traction. We did have Honduras sign the Cartagena Protocol, which gives them a little bit of um, international recognition in terms of they, they're striving to meet these standards that are in the land-based sources of marine pollution. But you see the countries, you know, that's the percentages that are from this sustainable development goals effort, which clean water and sanitation is the one of the, the groups that we selected that we tend to work on. So our partners in the Health Reefs Initiative feel like we're contributing to a number of these SDGs that each country has signed on to work towards by 2030. But this clean water and sanitation remains to be like the lowest ranking one. 
with major challenges and less improvement, although we do have some moderate improvements. Um, you can see that the climate action is the one where we're um, a bit on track for possibly reaching the goal in three of the countries. And so that's good news. And life below water is one that we should have better work. We should have better results on because that's been a major part of the effort. We, this, recommend, this uh, report card, we just decided to really streamline our recommendations and say what we need to do is basically enforce all the existing environmental regulations. In, in Honduras in particular, that decline in fish that they measured, they feel is largely just due to breakdown of law and order. So, and we continue to say we need more fish replenishment zones, that 3% doesn't get it, we need to have 20% in full protection. And that's gonna, the goal that we're gonna continue to you know, push for. Engage with private sector to support and incentivize sustainability. We don't feel like the private sector has been engaged enough and has not been able to really maximize all of the, the attention they could put on the reef, given that many of these businesses in the, in the Mesoamerican Reef are dependent on a healthy coral reef system. We outlined, there's two pages of stories of hope and I'll just let you, you know, read them for all of the countries and end with our website and picture of the partners from our last partner meeting out in Key Cochrane, Belize. So thank you. Go over. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you can write them on the chat in this platform. And uh, now I'm going to introduce to James Fan. He is the Global Director of Internews Environmental Programs and the Executive Director of Internews um, Earth Journalism Network, a global community of over 7,000 reporters who cover environmental topics. Uh, so welcome to James, who is going to talk about the EJN. Welcome, James. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you very much, Melanie, for that presentation. So really amazing reports. Good to hear the reef is being so well monitored. I do have a couple of questions I'd like to ask, uh, uh, if you don't mind. I just want to mention before I do that to all the participants, thanks again for joining us uh, this morning. And, and we'd, uh, you know, we're, we're glad to see, hear about your interest in uh, ocean issues. If you're still interested we would encourage you to look out for an upcoming opportunity we have. We're going to be providing fellowships to the UN Oceans Conference, uh, and that will be held in Lisbon in June of this year. That will be a conference focused on the 14th S Sustainable Development Goal, that's SCG 14, which Melanie referred to just a moment ago, uh, focuses on life below water. So if you'd like to do a lot more reporting, on, on these issues about the oceans, uh, please do look out for that fellowship opportunity that will be on our website soon. And we have a bunch of activities going on right now uh, regarding the oceans, in, especially in, in Asia, uh, as well as uh, this project in Central America. So Melanie, if you don't mind, I do have, uh, I would like to hear a bit more about what's, uh, going on, especially in Honduras, you mentioned there are some problems with enforcement. I'm not sure how familiar you are in detail with all that, but is there illegal fishing going on and uh, are there policy issues there or are there foreign fleets entering the waters? Do you have any insight uh, on that? I, I don't think there's any discussion about foreign fleets. It's mainly just lack of enforcement of the existing regulations they feel like that has escalated. So just kind of overall in society, um, the last few years, there's been this feeling that, you know, kind of law and order is breaking down more. So that, you know, that's a general social problem that transcribes over into the fishery. And in addition to that, there is like, um, they don't have as high percent of fully protected zones. So they've been increasing the area under protection but the amount that's actually fully protected from fisheries, that is the replenishment area, is still lower than most of the, of the other countries. So, you know, it's low, it can't replenish the areas that are out. So even if they were abiding by the law, that could become a problem. The, the major dive in those herbivorous fish is probably got to be so, and also related to gear, like using nets or, or um, fish traps. 
because they don't bite lines and that's the normal way of fishing there. So, you know, they could be spear fishing them, which is also banned in the whole Bay Islands marine park. So all of the islands. So illegal gear and just not enforcing the regulations being the main thing. Okay, great. Sounds like a good story for journalists in the region to cover. Yeah. Um, I also just curious, uh, of course, the, the news about the spread of the stony coral loss disease is very alarming. Is there anything that uh, these countries can do to help slow that down or stop it even? Well, I mean, having the best water conditions um, that you can, you know, if you can treat your wastewater and prevent other contaminants from coming in to the coastal waters that would further stress the corals, that's your best chance for them not getting sick. It's just like humans, right? If you're, if you're weakened due to other problems, you might catch that coronavirus or something. So we could link it to that, you know, something going on here. You want to keep your corals in as healthy a state as possible so they might not catch this. It's in the water. It, you know, we can't stop the water flow. So um, transmission between dive sites from tourists or researchers is an issue that could be an issue. So we've said, you know, and it's lucky for Belize that where it started is an area that's very lightly visited. Almost nobody goes there. So that may be part of the reason it really hasn't moved in the six months that it's been in Belize. It's barely, it hasn't moved. It stayed in that one area. Whereas in Mexico, it moved so much. There's a lot more boating and activity and people on the reefs in Mexico. So we have a, a on the website, there is information about how to decontaminate your gear. So it involves soaking your dive gear in, you know, chlorine bleach. So it's not very nice for your gear, but it does work, we think. It's, they've done tests on it and they know that these concentrations work. Um, we're also treating corals. So treating them to stop the lesions and that's having kind of variable success. It can be done on like really massive corals that are valuable or in a certain area like a park where you, just, you really want to keep this one section of reef nice looking. You can try to do that, but that just, it's not feasible on the scale of the whole reef. It's, it's very a very labor intensive process. Labor intensive. Yes, yeah. and then you have to go back, you treat it once, it kind of, it's like putting a band-aid literally on a wound, but the band-aid wears off, you know, kind of, and you have to go do it again and again. So. Right, uh, so uh, for other participants, uh, post your questions in the chat if you have any. I'm happy to keep asking questions, but we want to hear from all of you. So if you have questions, please just uh, let us know. Uh, I'll, I will ask one more uh, in the meantime. Melanie, I, I'm kind of curious if you have any insight. Wh how, what is the health of this Mesoamerican reef compared to other major reefs around the world? I'm thinking particularly the Great Barrier Reef, perhaps other reefs in the Caribbean. Do you have any sense? Is there a way we can compare how these reefs are doing? There would be if, if they kind of did a similar exercise. I mean, they, they're recovering from a major blow that we haven't experienced, you know, one of that scale. So that, that coral bleaching event that they had that like took out maybe half the reef, the, you know, the northern part of the reef was severely impacted. They are beginning to see some recovery from that, but I think it's variable, you know, in different locations. So maybe even to compare, you know, the, the Great Barrier Reef to the Mar is kind of an issue of scale. It's, it's just yeah. so much bigger. So may, we might compare ourselves to the Southern Barrier Reef, it might be somewhat similar, but maybe the Northern Barrier Reef would be in a bit worse condition. Um, looking just at the Caribbean, it's easier because our indicators are more like th those numbers that we use for biomass and, and coral cover and things like that are more applicable for, for the Caribbean. And we see, you know, some similarities. There's a lot of places that are a little bit worse than us, a few places that are a lot worse maybe a few places that are better. So, right. yeah, we're on the, I would say on the upper middle side. Okay, good to hear. Thank you, Melanie. Lucy, any questions from our audience? Not yet, but so I will uh, take advantage of that uh, to ask to Melanie. It was um, very curious for me to learn that the coral tissue loss disease spread the same, um, it spread in, in four years in Florida, which take in Mexico nine months. Yeah. Do you think, do you think is that because of the quality of water? What could, mm -hmm. 
you know, I don't know. Um, it, the, it, it also, the disease could have changed. I mean, we don't know what it is. We know par it's partly a bacteria because mm -hmm. antibiotics do work. So those treatments, like you see here, the people treating, that's some divers treating the coral. So that's what you do. You put this, some kind of like either epoxy or shea butter, or there's a certain uh, gel-like substance used in, in human surgery mm -hmm. applications they mm -hmm. use. But antibiotic in that will help stop it for a while. So okay. if that's true, then you've got bacteria. Yes, probably having more of them in the water or having the conditions in the water that allow bacteria to grow could be a factor. But we really can't say, you know, for sure because the exact cause of this disease is not known yet. Okay. Uh, what is the the way that you are right now take, attending the uh, taking care of this uh, uh, disease? I mean, what are the scientific procedures that you are doing instead to, to stop trying to stop the, the disease? It's this this right here, this kind of treatment the, the, that, what was so labor intensive. Mm -hmm. You actually like this, you can see, uh, can you see my cursor? As I'm, you see that movement? Oh, I'm not sharing no. screen, am I? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. I can see my screen. <laughs> Do you want me to share it again and point to something? Can share it. I think it's pretty uh -huh. quick. Does that work? No, oh yeah. Not yet. Uh, now yes. Okay. So I was trying to point to this. I thought I, I mm -hmm. thought you were all seeing that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. All that blue stuff. That's the that's like the um, compound, and then antibiotic is mixed in with that. Mm -hmm. Or actually, here in Mexico, they weren't using it. You know, yeah, they were putting chlorine bleach. So that was the first mm -hmm. thing to try: chlorine powder, like for a swimming pool put into this kind of chalky, thick, gel-like thing that gets pushed into the coral. And you push that along the lesion and it kind of, it can't stop it. The problem is it can break through and then start growing again. But you see like this one, how much, I mean, if a coral was that far along, it really doesn't make sense to try to treat it. You've got, it's gonna take you so long to go patch up all that. And then there's only a little bit of tissue left. So if you look at, if you can catch it here, like when the disease mm -hmm. starts, you could patch, put the, put the treatment on that and hope that it's not, but it looks like it's got another infection up there. And what they've found in Florida by like studying these, pulling them into the lab is that even when it looks good, or if like if you took a piece of that tissue up here that looks fine mm -hmm. and put that chunk into a, a tank with fresh water, good clean water, it could still develop the disease. Mm -hmm. So it's often there, it's like latent, it hasn't, it hadn't manifested itself yet. So often the whole coral is sick and you don't really know how sick it is. And then they're starting to look at the genetics of these corals to see, you know, are there certain genotypes that are more fit to withstand this particular disease? And then maybe those will be some of the ones that are, you know, divided up in the coral restoration efforts to try to make more corals for the future that will be able to withstand this, this new disease. Okay, and all the funds that you are using to, in, to investigate about this disease, where, who is giving you that, that money? Is the government, is the private sector, who are helping to, to investigate about it, this disease? Well, ours is mainly either we're doing a little bit from our standard, like um, the, the philanthropy. So that is mostly, you know, the Summit Foundation. So it's, it's private philanthropy for the most part. Um, Mar Fund has given some money, I think, in Mexico. That's um, I'm not actually sure where that allotment came from, which of their which of their um, funding sources that came from. But it's through the Mesoamerican Reef Fund, through the regular donors that are, have been supporting the work in the region. So I don't know of any government funds that are being spent on this actually. Okay, uh, in the Spanish version of this webinar, is someone asked about there, there are 12 years that you are doing this research, so 12 years of effort that uh -huh. you are do doing for the, for the MAR. So how do you communicate this to the governments in order to take actions, real actions? Yeah, well, there, I mean, if you, let me go back to, since you can all see my screen, when you look at the Royal We, mm -hmm. which is all of these, I mean, the government departments are in there. 
So the fisheries departments, often the, the protected areas departments of the government, they're part of this. So they're part of the ongoing dialogue that we have. Mm -hmm. They're often not the ones in the water monitoring. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there may be periods of time that they're not actively engaged with us. But when we finish a report card or an eco audit, we always have invite the governments to the launch and have them be part of the table to talk about mm -hmm. it, to respond to the needed actions. But you know, it just takes follow through. And then some, I think one of the problems for the increase in protected area to get more replenishment zone, that's a difficult political process. So nobody mm -hmm. wants to, you know, tell fishermen there's a larger space of mm -hmm. sea that you can't fish. So I understand that's difficult, but we, you know, that's an effort that we're like, determined to help make the education about that, to make them understand why it will actually help put more fish on the plate later if you do that. Um, the other, some of the other recommendations like working on the wastewater treatment, it's largely a function of funding. It's money because it's a lot of money. But I mean, we've had cases like in Honduras where IDB was poised to give projects that would improve wastewater treatment in like eight areas of coastal Honduras and then the project didn't go forward because, I don't know, they chose to do something else with their IDB funds, you know, a road or a football stadium or something like that. There was a choice made and that was a political choice. So I think that's where we, you know, we need to keep the pressure on and we need to have more, more of a constituency. Us, the NGOs talking to the government mm -hmm. is kind of what we've been doing for the last 10 years. I think we need to, that's why I think this private sector push getting the, you know, the dive industry, the hotel industry mm -hmm. in these countries to really step up and say, okay, we are with these conservation people and we want to see this reef protected because we're all going to lose business. We're going to lose jobs and money. Mm -hmm. if that's not done. Exactly. Okay. Um, um, what what, the, what does that mean? I'm sorry. Sorry, Lucy. Uh -huh. uh, so Melanie, if, there, if these governments were to increase their conservation zones, are, are you saying they should prioritize the spawning aggregation sites in, that you've identified? Is that the key, key place? That, that is one of the key places and areas that are like linked with um, mangrove, seagrass, reef, kind of in a nice um, unit, in a nice envelope of connectivity, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I read that uh, some two days ago, uh, Belize will officially enact its new bipartisan, uh -huh, the Fisheries Resources Act. What does that mean for the MAR? Yeah, well, that's that's good news because it really, um, the, the act was, I think, from 1970, I think, <laughs> I'm not correct. It was quite an old act. So they, you know, they've just modernized it. It's, it's, it's going to make enforcement more straightforward because there were many legal challenges to, you know, when they did try to, um, take lawbreakers to, to court, there were problems. So, but basically it's, it, it Belize has some of the strongest um, fisheries regulations in the region. So hopefully it will help make them more um, enforceable by having this new act in place. And it does legislate the, um, the, the zones for the, the managed access. So it kind of gives fishers an ability to have more of a territorial stake. So they, they work a certain area and the idea is that they'll be able to, to, instead of having just a national, they can move anywhere they want. They'll be licensed for Globers or for the Northern Barrier Reef or for you know a certain section of the reef. Okay. We still don't have questions from the audience. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we can keep talking. I have uh, more questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go if ahead. you don't mind. Uh, not only, so I know in Central America, when we, when we did our workshops there, one of the issues identified just by the journalists was the sargassum, uh, mm -hmm. the growth of sargassum, the seaweed, and how that affects uh, tourism and so on. Does that also affect the coral reef, or is that, is that tied in with the mac rise of macroalgae? Uh, how, how is it's, that? It's interesting. And there's, you know, it's still being studied, but it seems like that process is a little different than the macroalgae project process <laughs> because the macroalgae is, is fixed to the bottom, right? And then you've got this sargassum that's floating on the surface. And so surface waters and the water at the bottom can be slightly different. And 
the sargassum typically comes in to shore. It, it kind of blows in with the wind and the currents on the surface. So it can be a problem to the reef as it gets into shallow reef areas. It you know gets trapped and stuck and on the coastline where it, when it starts washing into shore it becomes the major problem because then that's where you get it all builds up and it's yeah. you know then decaying matter it's like you know raking up a bunch of stuff in the yard and then like sitting down under it to have a picnic it's just gross yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's you know it's acidic and it smells and it I, for tourism it's horrible but there have been fish kills there have been you know things that are along the coast which most of the reefs are a little a little farther than right on the beach shoreline but um it's similar you know nutrients are fueling it temperature is probably fueling it and possibly changes in ocean current patterns so you know that's kind of a bigger picture um scenario or there's something like the the sargasso sea you know has this big gyre and that's where that's the sargassum should be like out in the middle of the ocean and it's nice out there it provides habitat for many juvenile fish and things but when it the current pattern seems to have changed and then it begins washing in more and it's fueled by elevated nutrients whether those are from like amazon and orinoco rivers or from african dust or from a combination of everything including local sources you know it just fuels it because it's a floating plant and it will grow if it has nutrients and sunlight so okay Uh, I have other, other question. Which is the difference between um, herbivorous and commercial fish? Because you said that there are more herbivorous than commercial in the mar. What is happening? Why? Well, uh -huh. That, you know, that's a pattern that we tend to see. Um, I was going to, let me see. You want to see the, this is the slide that has the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that's, that's kind of typical that you have more herbivores than carnivores. So, mm -hmm. like, if you think of, you know, the plains in Africa, there's a lot more gazelles than lions. Uh, okay, okay. Right? That's the typical kind of pyramid. Um, there's, you know, evidence in the Pacific in some of their more pristine reefs that show an inverted pyramid. So, it's the opposite of that. They have very few herbivores and many sharks and carnivores. So, you know, that this could be something that's different in the Caribbean versus the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. um, it could be related to just Indo-Pacific. Many of those reefs have like almost no nutrient sources. So you wouldn't have many herbivores. And the Caribbean, we're kind of overrun with nutrients and plenty of algae plant matter mm -hmm. in, the, in the reef. Okay. We got a question from the audience. Omar Jimenez is asking, uh, in which aspects at the research level should we prioritize in Honduras with respect to the issue of the reef health or the health of the reef? That's a good question. I think um, understanding the fishery, what's going on. So that's almost like a social science research. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like where are the fishermen, where, where are the landings? You know, if, if somebody was studying the markets, the fish mm -hmm. landing markets over the last mm -hmm. years, you would see like, did all these parrot fish come into the market there? Did they go off to Jamaica? Because we had issues in Belize where, you know, there was exporting of, of parrot fish to Jamaica that kind of helped foster in the, the regulations we have now and, you know, get, get people to tighten up on the parrot fish issue. They're, they're not typically a, a very um, prized fish in this region, in the Mar, but in other parts of the Caribbean, they're one of the favorite fish. So mm -hmm. that creates a situation, you know, I don't know, maybe what happened to all the parrot fish in Honduras? Um, were they filleted and just sold as fillet? That happens a lot too. Um, or was it actually like wholesale, somebody got a permit to export off a lot of them? I think so. I think there is like an investigative piece that either a journalist or a social science could do. Like, uh, was there like a, a lot of equipment brought in, fish traps? Did somebody see a lot of fish traps being built where they shouldn't have been? You usually you notice those out in the water. So someone would have known that that was going on. So I think a little investigative piece would help get a little bit more to the root of that because our data can't show it. We just see the result you know we know that there's less fish 
but we can't say, you know, that's, we need to get into the communities and ask around and get that knowledge about what, what actually happened. Okay. Uh, maybe this is a common and frequently question, but I, I think it is necessary. How can we, people who don't live near to the coast, uh, help to support the health of the mar? What are we doing wrong and what, and what things can we improve? Well, I guess, first of all, everyone needs to be involved in their national and local politics and just support the people that do the right thing. You know, like you really want to support, you know, the, the politicians that have a mind to conservation and social justice and, you know, fairness, if they mm -hmm. exist, mm -hmm. support them and let, you know, through your, your mechanisms, let people know that, you know, this is important to us as a country. So mm -hmm. we are the people of each country and they need, you know, let, let the, the people in politics know that you care about that. That's step one, because that kind of mm -hmm. shows that it is a real issue and constituency. Um, then we've got to be prepared as people in the region, you've got to be prepared to, you know, pay for sewage treatment and pay for mm -hmm. clean water. And those are things that, you know, sometimes the communities uh, rally against it because they don't want to pay more for their, their mm -hmm. bills. But a little paying a little more there will prevent a lot of problems later on by, ha you know, keeping your ecosystem clean. Um, and then like what you buy, I think, you know, not buying the single use plastics, it's being banned, it's being phased out in most of the places. People help with that. And if you see, you know, if you see them still be sticking a straw in a container, you take it out and you say, no, thank you, I don't need this. It gets the message across. And also with the seafood you buy, making absolute certainty that you're in season, you're not buying things out of season or buying them undersized. So don't support poaching by buying, you know, the wrong thing. Okay. What about uh, journalists, Melanie? Um, you mentioned, for instance, there could be a story mm -hmm. in looking into Honduras fisheries and particularly what happened to the parafish there. Are there other stories that came to mind as you were, you know, finalizing this report, uh, stories in, or in any of the countries that you think are worth Yeah, I mean, I think just the pollution, like the, the, the need to clean our waters, keep our waters clean or clean them if, if they're not as clean as they should be. I mean, central Belize is kind of a, not a very um, populated area. I'm talking about the little Smithsonian station out in Caribou Key. And they measure just by doing these simple, it's called a Secchi disc. It's just a black and white, like plastic disc that you lower off the boat and you measure how many feet down that disc goes before you can't see it anymore. So that's a, a really rough measure of water transparency. And, you know, coral reefs are known to have this clean, clear water. And they measured, uh, you know, forgetting, we're gonna have to look up the number because sorry, I didn't plan on saying this, <laughs> but I think it was a 20, uh, it was a 25 foot or something re reduction, the reduction in clarity of the water um, in that region of Belize, which is not, it's known to be one of the better, you know, water quality regions in terms of just clarity and it looks good. And so over the 20 years, they measured an, a really significant decline in the clarity of the water. So that's a, a thing that's happening all over the Caribbean. So these are, there's some global processes, there's some local processes and probably regional stuff in the middle that's all contributing to it. But it, that's partly under our control. So as each country or even a municipality that, you know, enforce um, those regulations that have coastal vegetation being protected, that helps keep sand from running off into the water. Um, how you manage your solid waste if you're a, a tourist community, small island, and then looking upstream in the rivers, how you manage farms and that riparian buffer along the rivers that captures a lot of the sediment and having wastewater treatment for the population centers and even for remote hotels they can have better um, on-site management of, of sewage you have a lot of systems now that are you know small to treat just that hotel's waste and they can it can do a pretty good job of treating it but all those things have to be enforced and getting the water cleaner will will help. 
will help support. Yeah, those, uh, those wastewater treatment levels that you reported, less than 10%, I believe, in Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras, that's very low. Yeah, it was I'm even, surprised there isn't even lower than that. that. Where's, where's our numbers? Here we go. Mm -hmm. Look, I mean, look at Belize. <laughs> like, this is yeah. waste, the percent mm -hmm. of all wastewater that's treated. So that includes like um, industrial and municipal, you know, peoples, but 2.3. And so Mexico has a higher percent, but then it's treated to what level? And it might right. be injected into, you know, this deep well injection idea that they still do that some places in Florida. And it's like, it's going down to the aquifer, you know. They had some tests in Florida where they, they put um, dye tracer down into a, a toilet, a flush toilet in a hotel in the Florida Keys. And that, that, that hotel had deep well injection thousands of feet down. And that dye was out on the reef in like a number, a couple hours. It was wow. so immediate, you know, and the reef is far from shore there. It's not right. So yeah, these, these, the whole system. So even when we say we're treating it, like what we're doing with it is not really the right thing. So it's a huge problem. Is there a relationship between the, actually we have about five minutes left in our webinar. So if anyone has any questions, now's the time to ask them. But Melanie, I'm wondering, is there any relationship between between the the, the quality water quality and the spread of this stony loss coral disease? Has anyone studied whether the the poor, poor water quality is leading to the spread of that disease? It's I haven't read like a study that gave a really definitive answer on that. There's a lot of speculation about it, and you know, like. The location of where it started right off Key Biscayne um, in Florida. It was around the time of a major dredging of the Miami port. And so that disturbs water quality and really, you know, um, contaminants that have been buried in the bottom of the port, you can imagine, are many. <laughs> and that all gets bioturbation. Like it's like up into the water quality, water column, they move the sand, you know, onto land but it's already suspended in the water and it's just like stirring a really nasty pot of something that you don't want to, you've, you've liberated all that into the water column. So that happened. And also I'm told that, you know, in a meeting in Florida recently that there was, there are known um, cracks along the sewage outfall pipe, which still exists off of in that Virginia Key area that goes, um, you know, like a mile or something or, two miles, I'm not sure how far offshore it goes, but that pipe was cracked and leaking for years. And so there was, you know, sewage being, you know, put onto the reef in that same area. So that's all we know is that was going on at the time the disease kind of started and in that area where it first spread. Um, part of the reason it didn't spread as fast may be due to the currents because it went north pretty quickly. It took longer to go southward, you know, into the Florida, Key, Florida Keys because that was going against the Gulf Stream. You know, the massive flow of water was is going north. Great, thank you. Lucy, turn it over to you. Any more questions? No, we don't have any other questions. Maybe I would like that you share with us how did you fall in love with oceans? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I don't know. It was a little kid, you know, I was like in middle school, I think. I decided I wanted to be a marine biologist. And I guess I have to like attribute Jacques Cousteau to a bit of it. You know, I've heard a number of us marine biologists of my age say that because, you know, there was no Discovery Channel and there was no Nat Geo mm -hmm. Channel, and, you know. We, I had one chance per week at 5.30 on Sunday evening to watch the ocean. And that was Jacques Cousteau's story. So that was great, you know, that, and it makes me realize that, you know, television and just being able to see something in your home. I was in an inland part of, you know, the foothills of South Carolina. So I got to go to the beach once a year and get in the ocean. So that helped. But I really think it was largely those, all the mystery and the fun of exploration of that, that show with Jacques Cousteau really got me. Okay. I used to watch that show too, Melanie. I think it made a big impact on me too. 
Okay, so thank you for joining us in this webinar. And if our audience is going to produce any story based on this webinar, we will appreciate very much if you can share with us the links to that stories so we can also promote them in our social media networks. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, James, I don't know if you want to say something else. No, I'd like to thank Melanie for joining us mm -hmm. and for that excellent report. And as you said, Lucy, uh, if anyone out there produces stories, please do share them with us. We love to hear about them. Mm -hmm. And again, look on the earthjournalism.net website. We've got lots of opportunities coming up and going on right now for you to get grants or reporting fellowships and the like. So thanks everyone for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.